Good day. On Friday 19th February 2021, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov um, gave an interview to RBC. This is a Russian media group that mainly deals with business news um, in, the, uh, in Russia, a little bit like a Russian equivalent of Bloomberg. Um, this interview was clearly intended as a follow-up to an interview which uh, Lavrov gave a week earlier to Vladimir Solovyov, a well-known Russian journalist, which was posted by Solovyov on YouTube. I have previously discussed Lavrov's interview with Solovyov in an earlier programme for this channel, in which I explained that, in my opinion, some of Lavrov's words had been somewhat misunderstood and that he was not quite threatening the break-off with relations with the EU that some thought he was. Lavrov's interview with RBC is actually stronger, in my opinion, than his interview with Solovyov. I should say that it, is, it was clearly also made in anticipation of an EU foreign ministers meeting, which, is, which took place um, in Brussels on Monday 22nd February 2021. The point Lavrov was making in this interview with RBC is that there is no sense in Russia threatening to break off relations with the EU because as a result of EU policies, those relations barely exist anyway anymore. Um, here are, is some of the things that uh, Lavrov said when he discussed the matter with RBC. The partnership and cooperation agreement agreed between the EU and Russia entered into force in 1997. It contained a number of declarative goals for moving towards common economic, humanitarian and cultural spaces. For many years, we used a mechanism of summits, which were held every six months in Russia and in the EU alternatively. In fact, our entire government held annual meetings with the European Commission to discuss the participants' responsibilities in the context of over 20 sector-specific dialogues. We were building four common spaces and roadmaps for each of them. Though these were 100% substantive and specific projects, it was all destroyed, just like the Partnership and Cooperation Council, within which the Russian Foreign Minister and the High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy reviewed the entire range of relations. This disappeared long before the Ukraine crisis. In other words, all effective contacts between Russia and the EU authorities, the European Commission authorities, have come to a complete stop and have done so for a long time. Lavrov actually made the further point that Josep Borrell's now notorious visit to Moscow which has uh, elicited so much commentary and so many headlines, including on this channel, it was in fact the first visit by a EU representative of that rank to Moscow for around three years. In addition, Lavrov gave further examples of how relations between Russia and the EU have effectively and essentially come to a stop and how they did so even before the Ukrainian crisis uh, um, occurred. He referred specifically to the vexed issue of visa-free travel between Russia and the EU. He pointed out that there'd actually been a mutual agreement between Russia and the EU to have uh, visa-free travel between the two uh, blocks, but that the EU, having, then, having made that agreement with Russia and committed itself within a timeline to actually implement it, then reneged on it in order to grant 
visa-free travel to Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova first. Um, Lavrov, understandably enough, points out that this was clearly done as a way of telling the Russians that they were at the back of the queue and that Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, countries hostile to Russia, were at the front of it. And Lavrov goes on to discuss some of the consequences of this. He points out that once, not so long ago, Russia was um, one of the EU's major trade partners. And he gives the figures. The EU is, a, if you think the EU is a valuable trade and economic partner, here are some statistics for you. In 2013, the United States was the EU's biggest trading partner with about $480 billion trade, followed by China with $428 billion and Russia with $417 billion. That is, these numbers are of the same order of magnitude. Where do we stand now? In 2019, EU's trade with the United States stood at $750 billion, with China $650 billion, and with Russia at about $280 billion. In 2020, it was $218 billion, if counting with Great Britain, and $191 billion without it. In other words, Russia's trade with the EU has crashed even as the EU's trade with the US and China has grown. Of course, Russia, for its part, has now forged ahead with other trading partners and Lavrov pointed out the trade between Russia and China has doubled and has fully compensated for the fall in Russia's trade with the EU. I would add, by the way, that many of these figures are distorted by the fall in oil prices that took place in 2014, and it's likely that Russian export volumes to the EU have not fall fallen significantly. What has fallen markedly are EU exports up to Russia, exports of finished goods and agricultural products, which Russia no longer buys from the EU and no longer needs to buy, either because it is producing them itself as a result of its import substitution programme, or because it is now importing them principally from China. So the point Lavrov is making is that there is no real concern about um, a break-off of relations between Russia and the EU, because in substance and in reality, those relations simply don't exist anymore. But of course, that's not the only thing that Lavrov said. Lavrov said many things about the EU, and they are actually scathing. First of all, he makes it perfectly clear that though the EU Commission in Brussels imposes certain uh, uh, policies or, if you like, declamatory statements on EU member states, the EU member states individually and by themselves are happy to deal with Russia and do so frequently and on a regular basis, and that this includes even economic relations. He, in fact, Lavrov speaks of the EU Commission. He refers to it repeatedly throughout the interview as the party committee in Brussels. This is, of course, a derogatory reference to the Soviet Central Committee in Moscow, which used to dictate foreign policy and, in fact, all forms of policy to the various agencies of the then Soviet, uh, in fact, Russian government. So he is making a direct parallel between Brussels, which he sees as an ideological enterprise 
like the Soviet Communist Party and the former Soviet Communist Party and the way it used to run things in Moscow. And he describes situations where EU ministers turn up in Moscow, read out from a prepared speech that is given to them by, as he says, the party committee in Brussels, and then when, once that is out of the way, get down to real business, which in, usually and in practice has very little to do with anything that the EU says. Lavrov also complains at length about how EU policy seems to be fixated with the idea of sanctions, with these sanctions long having ceased to have any material point or material effect since Russia has fully adjusted to these sanctions and um, have become to the point where these sanctions have become a purely token measure. The point Lavrov again is making is that sanctions for the sake of sanctions have no value and no purpose. They simply get in the way of developing relations, but that the EU engages in them for no other purpose than as a form, if you like, of virtue signalling at Moscow's expense. Lavrov also talks at length about how the EU constantly appeases the uh, most hardline um, anti-Russian members of the, uh, uh, amongst the EU member states. And he particularly singles out the Baltic states for uh, particular crit criticism. Here, I think, by the way, Lavrov is being a little disingenuous. Um, in my opinion, the actual influence of the Baltic states and Poland on EU policy is highly limited. It's inconceivable that the Baltic states and Poland could genuinely dictate policy to countries like Germany and France. Um, if you like, Lavrov here is uh, invoking the policies of the Baltic states and Poland in order to give um, the Germans and the French um, a get out by saying that it's not really their fault, it's the fact that the EU Commission sides with the Baltic states that is the cause of all the trouble. But, of course, Lavrov also has extraordinary and scathing things to say about EU officials. I mean, he basically describes Borrell, the European high representative who recently visited Moscow, as a total buffoon. He talks about Morel, uh, Borrell coming previously to Moscow when he was foreign minister, a Spanish foreign minister, and talking about how the big bad Russian bear is back. And the Russians asked him to explain what he meant. And he tried feebly to explain that he was making a joke. He also, Lavrov also describes some rather interesting points about uh, Borrell's recent trip to Moscow. It seems that in advance of that trip, the Russians prepared a detailed uh, a survey of um, Middle Eastern affairs and set it all out in a dossier which they sent to the EU in advance of Burrell's visit, pointing to possible areas of cooperation between Russia and the EU to deal with uh, Middle East problems. When Burrell uh, arrived in Moscow and uh, Lavrov sought to move the discussion in their meetings to this dossier and to see whether or not Burrell and the EU might be interested in following up on the suggestions made in the dossier. It turned out that Burrell not only had not read the dossier, but was not even aware that it even existed. Um, uh, um, Lavrov asks mockingly, what sort of people are these at the, in the EU who are in charge of its policy 
and who we are expected to deal with. So it's absolutely clear from all of this that Lavrov, and one must presume the entire Russian leadership, has simply stopped taking the EU seriously. Not only do they not regard it as a reliable partner, but they regard it, they consider it to be an incompetent ideological enterprise, a, quite, a kind of quasi-party committee in Lavrov's terms, run by buffoons. Um, from now on, Russia's policies will be focused on dealing directly with EU member states individually, rather than worrying about what Brussels thinks and about what Brussels does on any international question. If the EU imposes further sanctions on Russia, well, the Russians have already said that they will shrug their shoulders and they will ignore them because the sanctions weapon has essentially lost its effect. Lavrov didn't only talk about relations with the EU in this extraordinary interview, though uh, they were, as I said, the primary uh, focus of, uh, of the interview. He also talked about relations with the US. And here I got the impression, by the way, that he was moderately hopeful that a corner might soon be turned and that relations with the US might start actually to become a little less icy. He is aware, for example, that the US is not apparently intending to impose the kind of across-the-board sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that was at one point being talked about. I've recently done a program about this. And he also, of course, pointed out that the US has agreed to extend the New START Treaty, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, um, for five years on Russian terms. I've also done a programme about that. He also had some very interesting things to say about Turkey. He acknowledged that Turkey has good relations with the Turkish-speaking uh, states that form the former Soviet Union. And he also spoke about Turkey's extremely ambitious and forceful foreign policy. But he discounted any idea that Turkey might be working towards a greater Turan federation. That is a concept of Turkey acting as the central part of some great complex of Turkish speaking states spreading across Central Asia and the Caucasus. He seems to think that neither the states of the former Soviet Union, the former Turkish-speaking states like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan are really interested in that sort of project, and uh, nor are the Turks themselves. By the way, uh, Turkish President Erdogan who still apparently is having difficulties communicating with the Biden administration, has just had a lengthy and apparently very friendly discussion with Russian President Putin, which seems to have focused on strategic questions and energy policy. So, in overall, Lavrov seems to realise that uh, relations with the EU are at a complete dead end and are likely to remain so. And frankly, he is not interested in restarting them in any shape or form anymore. He has seen what the EU is like. He sees it as an ideological enterprise and he also considers it to be completely incompetent in what it does. He does intend to pursue closer relations with, EU, with individual EU states, Germany in particular, but no doubt others. He also has expectations in the future of at least a more predictable relationship with the United States, even if not a friendly one. And he speaks of Turkey as a continuing partner. One must assume that in saying all of these things, Lavrov 
speaks for the Russian leadership and for Putin also. So there we are. The EU, through all its policies, through backing Ukraine, about which, by the way, Lavrov also has much to say, through imposing sanctions on Russia, through uh, carrying out a public relations campaign against Russia, has managed to alienate and antagonize Russia, probably beyond retrieval. It's managed to do the same thing also, by the way, with its two other major neighboring countries, Britain, with which it has a complex relationship and which has, of course, now left the EU, and Turkey, where President Erdogan has perennially bad relations with almost all EU governments and with the EU Commission also. That suggests to me that the people in Brussels have really a urgent need to reconsider what they're doing. Perhaps, as Lavrov says, the doors are now indeed shut and Moscow, at least, has no interest in opening them up again. But if that is so, then it's difficult to see how the EU, if it can't talk to countries like Russia, can retain international significance. Obviously, if the EU does want to regain that significance, then it needs to change its policies in a radical way and needs to stop thinking like, as Lavrov also put it, the boss who comes along and gives lectures and starts negotiating with countries like Russia and, of course, Britain and Turkey on a more equal basis. Will that happen? I have to say, I doubt it. But if it doesn't happen, well, the lesson as to what the results will be is now there. Thank you for joining me on this programme. Please check us out on our other programmes, which we do on our other channels. You, uh, our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. Please also check out Alex's own channel. you find links under this video. Please uh, um, also check out, check out, check us out on our other platforms, BitChute, Library, Odyssey, Rumble and the rest. And we look forward to your support on Patreon, Subscribestar, PayPal and via Bitcoin. And also please look up our shop where you find our amazing products, our great magic mugs, our phenomenal T-shirts, long sleeved and short sleeved, 100% cotton, by the way, um, our sweatshirts, our hoodies, our hats. And I look forward to you joining me on my next program and have a great day.